chapter, and I'm going to pray. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Father, thank you for your word. I know that your word is already anointed, and I give you all the thanks today, and I give you all the praise that not one of my words are going to fall to the ground, but they'll go into the seed or the, the, the soil, rather, of the hearts of these people and will bring forth much seed. You said, Lord, your word would set us free. It's your word that's anointed. And I give you the praise today that as I open my mouth, you will fill it. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, Amen, amen and Amen. Matthew, the sixth chapter, we are continuing part two of our message. Let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. And believe me, in the times that we're living in, we better know that scripture. Neither let it be afraid. Amen. So Matthew uh, 6, uh, reading from verse 30 through 34 in the Amplified Bible says this, but if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and green, am I at the right scripture? Yes, I am. Um, where are we? Uh, today is alive and green, and tomorrow is tossed into the furnace. Will he not much more surely clothe you, or you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry and be anxious now, how are we worried and anxious? I want you to see the next word. This is what, how you bring it upon yourself. Saying. Doesn't come till you speak it. I'm teaching the word. Saying. What are we going to have to eat? What are we going to have to drink? What are we going to have to wear? And I could put in there. What's going to happen to us today? This is what the enemy is planning for this generation. A spirit, many spirits of fear have been unleashed from the hordes of hell for this generation. But my Bible tells me that God never gave me a spirit of fear but of power, love, and a sound mind. And when you're operating in fear, beloved, you've got anything but a sound mind. So do not worry. Don't be anxious saying all these things. For the Gentiles, the heathen, wish for and crave and diligently seek all these things. And your heavenly Father knows well that you need them all. But seek Aim at and strive after, first of all, his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right. And then all these things taken together will be given to you besides. So do not worry or be anxious for tomorrow. I'm going to say that again. Beloved, hear the voice of the Lord. Do not worry or be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will have worries and anxieties of its own. Sufficient for each day is its own troubles. That's the life we live. That's the world we're in. But again, I tell you what the Bible tells us as Christians. We might be in this world, but we're not of it. You know, as I was teaching last week about Caleb, he had a different spirit. The Bible actually uses the word different. He said Caleb had a different spirit. At 84 years old or however old he was, I think it was 84, somewhere in there anyhow, he said, give me the mountain. I've been waiting a long time for my inheritance and I'm not giving up till I get it. How long have you been waiting for the promise of God to manifest or take, take care of you? How long have you been waiting? And you may get weary and well-doing, but I'm here to tell you today, don't let it happen. Because the enemy is trying to wear the saints of God out. The scripture is very clear. That's what he does. Wears out the saints, if he can. But the only thing that can keep you strong is the word of God. 
It's the only thing. You need to hear the word ministered to you. When you come to church, you need to hear the word and the word only. And that's what this this minister here and this pulpit's all about. Speak the word only. And that selfsame hour his servant was healed. You can receive anything you need from God as long as you know what scriptures you're standing on and you're speaking God's word. God's word. Not what somebody else thinks. Not somebody else's anointed opinion. But what does God say? And today I'll tell you, I'm on fire. Wow, I'm on fire. I feel it. You know, the Bible says it's shut up in my bones. And I'm mad. I'm mad at the devil. Because I see exactly what the scripture says. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The thief, not God. Jesus said, I have came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. More abundantly. So when I stand here and I say to you, I'm mad, I'm not, we're not dealing with flesh and blood. I'm not mad at people. I'm mad at what I see the devil try to do to God's precious people. That's what gets me mad. And it's a righteous anger. And I could no more help it than I can help breathing. Because it's shut up inside of me. It's what went into me the night that I got saved in 1977. And it's never left me. It's never left me. I never heard anything, anything about the authority of the believer in my lifetime. I didn't even know where Genesis was in the Bible. But when I got a hold of the scriptures that talk about the authority of the believer, I got a hold of it. And I realized how the church, and I can look back now over all these years and see how the church has been sleeping. Well, it's time for that sleeping giant to wake up and take our place in society. Because this world is waiting for your light to shine. Souls shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Oh, glory. Well, that was your chance to say amen. You missed it. Hallelujah. Jesus told us in John 14, 27, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Matthew 6, 34, here it says, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will, for tomorrow will worry about its own things, sufficient for the day in its own trouble. God does not want his children worrying. He does not want us stressing out. He wants you to know that he gives you all the help you will need for this day. Never mind about tomorrow, just today. This is the only day you've got, beloved. You don't have tomorrow. Yesterday's gone. But you have today. He doesn't want you to worry. He wants you to know that he gives you all the help that you will ever need for the day that you're in today. And when tomorrow comes... So will fresh help from him come. You see, this is God's principle. Even in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, when the children of Israel were in the desert, you don't get any drier place in life than the desert. You know, naturally they were in the desert, but they were also in a very spiritual desert. God gave them Fresh manna from heaven every morning. You can study this out in Exodus, the 16th chapter. They did not have to worry about tomorrow. I just heard that old song again. The Scottish Cameron sang it years ago. I'm just, I don't, you th- might think I'm crazy, but I'm just led by the Holy Ghost. No need to worry about tomorrow. It's all in the master's hands. No need to worry about the future because it will be as he has planned. Whether the day be stormy, whether the day be fair, no need to worry, no need to hurry for he'll be right there. You want to sing it with me? Come on, you want to sing it with me? Let's wake up. 
Let's be alive. That's what church is supposed to be. Come on. No need to worry about tomorrow, for it's all in the master's hand. No need to worry about the future, it will be as he has planned. Whether the day be stormy, whether the day be fair, no need to worry, no need to hurry, for he'll be right there. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So they didn't have to worry about tomorrow because when tomorrow came, there was fresh manna again. But you know what happened to them? They got tired of the manna, didn't they? They started to grumble and complain again, just like we do today. We're always looking for something new. And the only way you'll be satisfied with anything is when you understand God's word. Because it's not new. It doesn't change. It's the same as Jesus. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And once you get that manna, that fresh manna inside of you, you will want for nothing. The rogue waves can hit your ship, beloved, and you can feel like you're tossed to and fro, and you wake up during the night screaming, Lord, Lord, help me. He's there. And let me tell you where he is. He's in the hinder part of the ship, sleeping, and he's telling you to do the same thing. Go to sleep, child, he's saying. I've never left you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I am here. I am with you. I am with you always, even till the end of the age. So he was their provision every day. Every day. Today, God's manna for you and I, is the grace that he gives you every day. The grace, he said, my grace is sufficient for you. Let me say something to you I hope you'll never forget, beloved. You cannot live on the echoes of yesterday. You can't. You'll find yourself getting down and down and down because yesterday is dead. You can't stay in death. You have to stay in life. Every day, you and I as Christians receive God's manna, and it's in the form of his grace. If you're worried today about a situation, you're worried about tomorrow, know that when tomorrow comes, there'll be sufficient grace for you for that situation. Wait till it comes. Cross that bridge when you get to it. God wants you to simply rest, rest in his ability to heal you, to deliver you, to protect you, and to provide for, your, for you every single day. Amen. And he will. Does it always come just the way we want it? You know, no, we're in this fast, 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 fast lane of life. This generation, there's never been a generation that has known anything faster than this one. Technology, everything. But God's not in a hurry. And he says to you and I, in my time. And listen, can I, say, can I just be real? This is an area I have worked on. My children can tell you I've worked on it. Ask that lady in the front row. Patience is not something I was gifted with. Thank you. One honest person in here. When I say I want something, I want it yesterday. <laughs> but I've had to learn to process. And I'm still learning. I'm still learning more today than I ever did in my life. And I thought when I got to my time of life, you know, when you're in your 50s, you know, you're supposed to have learned something. <laughs> Some of you are looking up here, she's for real? Yeah, I'm for real. <laughs> so when tomorrow comes... As I said, I'm preaching this to me. His grace will be sufficient. In the Old Testament, when the armies of the Moabites and the Ammons, and they came together, King Jehoshaphat was in among them. 
And God told the anxious king, do not be afraid or dismayed. I love the scripture, beloved, for the battle is not yours. It's God's. You will not need to fight in this battle. Just stand still and see the salvation of your Lord. When you've done all to stand and you've got the scripture inside of you, then stand. And believe me, I have seen God over and over. Oh, it's never, I don't think ever one time ever been in my timetable. Because if he'd gave me what I wanted when I got, when I wanted it, it would have destroyed me. Are you hearing me? Sometimes, you know, when God doesn't answer a prayer, that is the answer. Think about that for a minute. He's telling you, there's no need to answer you right now because you're not ready. Now you think about it. So when the next morning came, King Jehoshaphat saw how God, God is the only one that can do this, these things. God can do in one second what it could take you 50 years to try to figure out. But King Jehoshaphat saw that God, such, God caused such confusion to come in the camp that it brought about their own slaughter. Amid all the fighting in the enemy's camp, God's people merely stood still and saw him fight the battle for them just as he had promised. So what am I saying to you today? Fear not. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be dismayed. When you see a problem looming in your tomorrow, and we all have things we have to handle every day. Don't be afraid or dismayed. Look to the Lord. Look to his grace. Let his salvation deliver you, spirit, soul, and body. When you got saved, it just wasn't, you know, that you're saved now and you're going to heaven. Thank God for that. We watched a, a general of God yes. depart from our face of this earth this week or last week. And I just happened to notice early this morning, I just, they, had a, they were lining the streets to pay a man of God honor, Billy Graham. And let me tell you, he, 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 all of heaven was rejoicing. What a day that will be when my Jesus, I will see. Here we go again. <laughs> I'm not singing it. When I look into his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand, leads me to that promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. Yeah. That will be. But while we're here, God's salvation is for every part of us. He knows we're human. He knows the frailty of our flesh. He knows all about us. He knows we have feet of clay. And that salvation stretches to every part of your need, spirit, soul, and body. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God wants you and I to live a stress-free life. I don't think for one moment that this is easy when you're, when you're in full-time ministry because stress just comes with the territory. And I have learned my best to cast it down. It's not always easy. And I still have sleepless nights, but I try to train myself to do what I try to teach you to do. Because we all face that adversity at one point or another. We do. Is anybody here? He doesn't want you to be stressed. He doesn't want you to be filled with worries about tomorrow's problems. Because he's there when tomorrow comes. His grace will be there for you. He'll be there to help you, he'll protect you, he'll give you favor, and he'll enable you to come through. Believe me when I tell you, I know. Pastor Sandy said something yesterday that went into my spirit. She said it more than one time. But she said, and I put it into my message late last night. 
She said, but you'll also find out that it's hell to show up before he gets there. That's why God is saying through faith and patience, you inherit the promises of God. You don't always inherit them like that. And then I have people come to me all the time, well, Pastor, Pastor, why didn't that work? The secret things belong to God. There are things you and I don't have the answers to. He's got that book. And it's someday you'll find out book. And he'll open that book and he'll show you. But meantime, you trust him. Meantime, you get on with your life. And you don't have to walk around like a Christian like this. Oh, oh, I don't know what today is going to bring. Oh, I tell you, when I hear that stuff, I remember the book that I read years ago, God, what do I do when strangulation is not an, ob- an, <laughs> a not an option? <laughs> Thank God I read that book years ago. Because <laughs> it's the truth, isn't it? Moaning and groaning and bahooing and poor me. People are starving all over this world. Being blown up. Not even a tent to sleep in. And we complain. Well, moving right along. Hallelujah. So it's hell to show up before he gets there. We better know that he's taken us there. But you see, beloved, we don't always see things clearly in the moment. It's looking back you see many things. You see God's hand. Let me read something to you. It's about a king in Africa who had a close friend that he had grown up with. The friend had a habit of looking at every situation that ever occurred in his life. And he looked at it positive all the time, never negative. And he always said, this is good, this is good, this is good. One day, the king and his friend were out in a hunting exhibition. You may have heard this, I've talked uh, years and years ago. But for those who haven't heard it, bear with me. So he was out in a hunting expedition and the friend would, uh, would load and prepare the guns for the king. So the, ki- the friend had apparently done something wrong in preparing one of the guns. For after taking the gun from his friend, the king fired it and his thumb was blown off. Examining the situation, the friend remarked, as usual, this is good. to to which the king replied, this is not good, and proceeded to send his friend to jail. About a year later, the king was hunting in an area that he he should have known to stay clear of because there was cannibals there, and they captured him and took him to their village. They tied his hands, stacked some wood, set up a stake, and bound him to the stake. As they came near to set fire to the wood, they noticed that the king was missing a thumb. Being superstitious, they never ate anyone that was less than whole. So untying the king, they sent him on his way. As he returned home, He was reminded of the event that had taken his thumb and felt remorse for the treatment of his friend. He went immediately to the jail to speak with his friend. You were right, he said. It was good that my thumb was blown off. And he proceeded to tell the friend what had just happened. I'm so, so sorry. Please forgive me for sending you to jail for so long. It was bad for me to do this. No, his friend replied, this is good. What do you mean this is good? How could it be good that I sent you to jail for a year? Well, king, if I had not been in jail, I would have been with you. The moral of the story, all things happen for a reason. But remember, You don't always see what the end result is 
The teacher doesn't give you the answer during the test. Mm -hmm. But we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Are you hearing me today? Glory to Jesus. Proverbs 18.21 says it this way. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Say that again. And those who eat it will enjoy the fruit thereof. Yeah, you've been hearing things for a few years, haven't you? Praise God. Good for you. You got an A+. Plus. <laughs> Many things in life can cause us to fear. Losing our jobs, deadly diseases, terrorist attacks, and so forth and so on. When these things confront us, beloved, we tend to give in to worry and fear. Let's just be honest about it. And we start talking about our fears. But Jesus told us, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Job was no different. He constantly feared that God would punish him and his family because he kept thinking that his sons had sinned against God. He would get up real early in the morning to offer burnt sacrifices, saying to the Lord, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And the Bible tells us that he did this regularly. He kept saying over and over and over again, my sons are in sin, my sons are in sin. Oh, when is that blow going to hit them? You can read this for yourself in Job 1, verse 5. Job kept confessing the, son, the sins of his sons and fearing that something terrible would happen to him and his family. In fact, his sin consciousness didn't just produce fear. The Bible tells us that he greatly feared. He greatly feared the thing that would come upon him, and it did. And the thing that Job feared came upon him. Talk the way you want to be, and you will be the way you talk. It is important that we understand that it was Job's sin consciousness that opened the door to Satan. You can read it for yourself. God looks, he, he was coming, Satan was coming to God to accuse Job of this, that, and the next thing, and, and do this and do that. This is your servant. What, what? And God interrupted him and said, he's already in your hands. Mm -hmm. He's already in your hands, devil. Can't you see that? We will not know all the answers till we get there, but I know one answer in my heart. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And as he speaks, so he will become. I am convinced that that is one of the strongest doctrines in the Bible. God said, let there be light. Everything, everything is seed. And everything brings forth from your lips to bring it to life, negative or positive. So that sin consciousness opened up that door. His preoccupation with sin that his family may have committed gave Satan the opportunity to bring death and destruction into his life. I'm not saying this. It's the Bible. Study the book of Job and you'll see it. The hedge was removed and Satan attacked. Job 1, 9 through 12. Beloved, Today, if you've missed the mark, which sin means, if you've missed the mark, and we all have, come on. There's nobody in here perfect. But today, if you have sinned, don't say, I've failed again. I deserve to be punished by God. I've been there. I've done all that until I got this revelation and realized I could never speak that way again to God. Because it's not just God that's listening. It's principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world. You're not dealing with flesh and blood, beloved. Hallelujah. So what do you say? You say what the scripture says. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. 
You are my holiness and perfection. 1 Corinthians 1, 30, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I didn't earn it. I couldn't earn it. If I, I couldn't buy it if I had 10 trillion billion dollars. It's a free gift. I, have you ever really ever said thank you, Lord, for your grace? See, beloved, when I teach this stuff, it is so real to me. I can taste it. You hear all the time, well, I'm just, I'm just a sinner. Well, you can be a sinner if you want. I'm not. What do you mean? I was a sinner. I was the chiefest like the Apostle Paul. But he came. He redeemed me. I'm no longer a dirty old sinner saved by grace. I was that, but I was saved by grace. And because of that, I became the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And when I sin and I go to God and I say, Lord, you saw again. I don't need to tell him. He already forgave me because he knew I was coming. It's your heart attitude with God. It's all in the heart. It's all in your heart. He sees your heart. He's the only one that knows your heart. Look at King David. Look at all the things he did. Anybody murdered anybody lately? He put Uriah right out in the front line. Says, make sure he doesn't get back alive. Hide in his sin. Hide in his sin. Hide in his sin. But that was the man that God said, he's a man after my own heart. Oh, yeah. glory to God. I just preached me happy. Because the truth is the truth. God says, I'll look beyond your faults and I see your need. But you have to get to the place where you say, I am the man. That's where David had to get to. When the, when the prophet came to him, why do you need that little lamb? Don't you have enough of your own? And the prophet, Nathan, you're the man, David. Now, David could have made all his excuses in the world, like we all do. Whatever you compromise to keep, you will eventually lose. Trust me. I know what I'm talking about. David went into sackcloth and ashes. I am the man. I own it. I own what I've done. And to the day he died, he believed that God would take care of him. King David is a tremendous example of God's grace in the old covenant. Tremendous example. He went into sackcloth ashes when the child that he conceived with Bathsheba was very ill and he fasted and he prayed and he asked God to spare the child. What had happened? It got real quiet in the courts that day, real quiet because his men had to go to him and tell him that the child was dead and they did not know how David was going to respond because he had been going literally mad. Crying out to God. The Bible says that, that they could hear him all through the palace. And you're talking steel, steel doors, yea big. You couldn't hear through those things unless somebody was in mortal agony. And they didn't know how he was going to respond. They didn't know if they were next for the chopping block. They didn't know what was going to happen. And they quietly, sire, sire, David knew. David heard God's voice. David knew. You might think you're not listening, you're not hearing God, but most of you know in here. You can deny it if it's your flesh that's getting stronger, but in here, you know. I know when I have to repent. I know when I have to say I'm sorry. Could I ask you a question? What's really hard about those two words? It's our pride. 
See, that's why Satan fell. Pride. That's the biggest spirit in this world, pride. So, what did David do? Make me something to eat. What? Sire, did you hear what we said? I know what you said. Make me something to eat. He can't come to me, but I can go to him. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. That's the example of a person that knows their God. Are you hearing in today? Because I'm telling you, I'm not in my notes. But I love it when the Holy Ghost takes over. You see, you can study to show yourself approved, beloved, a workman rightly dividing the word of God. And I use notes and I do all of that. But let me tell you something. If I don't leave room for the Holy Ghost, we may as well hang it up. Because I have people come to me all the time after a message and say, you were talking right to me. How can I be talking to them and another 30 behind them? Because it's not me, it's the Holy Ghost that took over. And somebody in here, when I said those words, I can't, he can't come to me, but I can go to him. You have that in your heart. You're a woman that's sitting out there that's lost your husband. I don't know how many, there might be more than one, but I'm telling you now, that was for you. And you had your, you had your heart go like this. And I'm obeying the Holy Spirit right now. You'll go to him. You'll see that man again. Just like King David saw that child again. And God blessed his union with Bathsheba. The union that was never of God to begin with. Are you hearing me? In the first place, and I'll just, okay Lord. David was in the wrong place at the wrong time. His army was out fighting and he stayed home to sleep. Have his wine, have his concubines, and every other thing he had. If he had not been there, he would not have looked out of his window and saw Bathsheba naked uh, bathing herself. And he had every concubine, every most beautiful woman that God ever made in the face of the earth, but he lusted after her. So it wasn't all Bathsheba's fault. Hello. She didn't know the king was there because her husband, Uriah, was in the front lines. She didn't know. And that's clear in the scripture. But when the king summoned you, you came. We know the rest of the story. But God. Isn't God good? But God. But God, Jesus, oh Jesus, oh hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. I will not let my heart be troubled, neither will I let it be afraid. Because no matter what tomorrow holds, I know who holds tomorrow. So we must be very mindful, and I'm going to close in a few moments. We must be very mindful of what we believe and say regularly. I'm not talking about now and again you slip up, but regularly speaking negative, negative, negative. Afraid of this, afraid of that. I don't want to go to the doctor because I know what he's going to say to me. Well, you know, he might just say you're in perfect health. You know, we we get all these thoughts into our minds. So I'm saying to you from the bottom of my heart today, death and life are in the power of your tongue. So when you hear of a deadly virus taking many lives, don't say, I'm next. I'm next because I haven't been a good Christian. God's going to get me. No, if he was going to get you, you'd have been got a long time ago. I know I would have been. Instead, you say, Jesus, 
You are my righteousness. You are my protection. Surely you shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence, Psalm 91.3. Beloved, such believing and confessing not only please God, but they also shut the door on Satan that he cannot make any inroad into your life. I've got more notes, but I'm closing with something funny. Is that all right? I feel like a laugh. Do you want a laugh? I didn't hear enough of you. All right. The story, and again, this is an oldie and a goodie. The story is told of an 80-year-old wife. She's 80 years old. She was arrested for shoplifting. And when she went before the judge, he asked her, what did you steal? She replied, a can of peaches, Your Honor. The judge asked her why she had stolen them, and she replied that she was hungry. The judge then asked her how many peaches were in the can, and she replied, six. Then the judge said, I will give you six days in jail. Before the judge could actually pronounce the punishment, the, the woman's husband spoke up and asked, Judge, Judge, can I say something, please? Yes, what is it? The husband said, she also stole a can of peas. So evidently, she was an nagging wife and he wanted rid of her for a while. <laughs> Hallelujah. Every head bowed and every eye closed. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> it's okay to laugh in church. It really is. God's laughing at us every day. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Glory, glory, glory. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, you are so good. You are so gracious and so kind and so good to all of us. Now, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for everyone within the sound of my voice. I pray that everyone knows you, Lord, as their Savior, the most precious gift of all, the gift of Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you're not sure that you've ever really been born again, and you've heard this message and you've said, I, I want that, I want that freedom, I want that, I want to know God that way. And you would say, I'm not sure if I've really ever been saved. It's so simple. You don't even have to come out of your seat. God sees your heart where you're at, but you need to confess it with your mouth. You need to believe in that heart and confess the Lord Jesus Christ with your mouth. And the Bible says you shall be saved. So if you're here today and you would say, Pastor, would you please pray for me? I just want to make sure before we close this service, because it's the most important decision you will ever make in your lifetime. It will be for eternity. If there's anyone here that would say, please pray for me, please put your hand up, put it right back down again, signifying that you need prayer. God bless you, son. I see your hand. Put it back down. Anyone else that would say, I need to, I need to know Jesus today? I think, yes, I see that hand. God bless you. I see that. One more? Okay, thank you, Jesus. Anyone this side, Pastor Sandy? Okay. I can't see. Okay. So that's three people that we see. Is that right? Three? Okay. Praise God. Praise. Let's give Jesus a big praise. Thank you. So now, you, you know the ones that will raise your hand, and I'm going to pray with you. And Pastor Sandy uh, will be at the back of this church and other leaders here. They'll give you some information and some uh, documentation that you can take home and, and read and become a strong Christian. And if you do not have a, a home church, you're welcome to here. But I believe today the main thing for you is to pray this prayer. Could you say with me, Heavenly Father, today I'm giving you my life. I am confessing my sins to you, Lord God. And this day, I receive Jesus as my Savior. And this day, I make him my Lord. And I thank you now that I have believed in my heart and I have confessed with my mouth. And I now know that I am saved. And if you said that for the first time, welcome. Welcome to the body of Christ. God bless you. God bless you, bless you, bless you. Praise God. Let's stand to our feet if we can. Thank you, Lord Jesus, before I pronounce the blessing. 
If you are visiting today, please come up and say hello to me. I'd like to know who you are and maybe say a word of prayer with you if it's necessary. And I'm just so grateful for the wonderful service we had today. Isn't this awesome? <laughs> Hallelujah. It's awesome. God is so good. So now I'm reading Numbers 6, 24 through 26. And what I'm doing here is rightly dividing the word of truth. And you see, in the old covenant, they prayed for this to happen, and they were absolutely right. But we are in the new covenant. It's already happened. And so we pray it in the present you see, the night that I got saved, God gave me a scripture, and he said, create in me a clean, I got the scripture, and it was very, very real, and for months I would say this, create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and renew in me a right spirit. I'd always be in my prayer closet, create in me a clean a new heart, Lord, and renew in me a right spirit, all the time, and one day the Lord interrupted me. You know what prayer is? It's waiting to hear his voice, but most of the time we don't shut up long enough. <laughs> So one day he interrupted me. He said, excuse me. I said, yes, Lord. Why do you keep asking me to do what I did for you the night I saved you? I says, but every day, Lord, I want, I want a new. He says, when you were given a heart from your mother and father, you know, in your mother's womb, do you get a new heart every day? No. He says, you received a new heart, and a right spirit that night. Now confess it. And by God, it didn't take me long to do it. I thank you, Father, that I have a new, new heart, new spirit. I thank you, Lord, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I thank you that I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I thank you, Father, that I have your power inside of me. That power in the earthen vessel and the seed of God has produced great fruit in my life and great fruit in this ministry and great fruit in my children, their children's children, children's children to come. And I'll look over the banisters of heaven someday and I'll see them raising their hands to you if you tarry, Lord. Am I in the right church? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. So now, I, now you know why I'm saying it this way. The Lord has blessed you. The Lord has kept you. The Lord has made his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord has lifted up his countenance upon his church and he's given you peace. Wow. That's why it's on that sign as you go down the, the, the driveway. This is important that you leave a church blessed not condemned, not under this heavy cloud of convict, uh, condemnation. The Holy Ghost will convict you, but he will not condemn you. You know why? That condemnation was put on that tree. Amen. He paid the price for me. Yes, oh, glory. I, I don't even want to stop. This is really, really. Could we just raise our hands to the Lord right now? Just, just, 